Just want to keep on singing. Well, it is now afternoon, so good afternoon to you. Um, today, we're going to get into the Word of God. Now, we got to hear an awesome welcome from Alex and Nishi. That was awesome. Amen. And then my brother OJ just laid it all on the line poured his heart out about before he was a disciple and after, and I just appreciate the humility, bro, and your heart to tell us the things that you struggle with and how you've overcome. Uh, God is working so powerfully in the lives of O.J. and Jaleesa. I'm so very proud of them, uh, so blown away. Uh, Helen and I got to go up Friday night to the north. Amen. The force in the north is alive and it's going awesome. And we got to speak, uh, get some fellowship with them on the rooftop, literally on the rooftop. And uh, I'm just so blown away by, by what they're doing. So, bro, thank you for your humility and your, your powerful leadership. And, Jaleesa, thank you for some great insights on contribution. I honestly haven't thought of it that way. So, amen. Yes, we do need to take care of the church, but it's really for us to give our contribution. So, right now we're going to get into the Word of God. We're going to study out some things today about the Spirit of God. I don't know about you, but I spent many years of my life thinking about, wondering about, heard about the Spirit of God, and I had all kind of stupid, crazy ideas that have nothing to do with the Bible. And so if you've got some misunderstandings about the Spirit, I hope that today you get a little bit of a, a tidbit of what it means to really have the Spirit of God with you. Amen. We're going to open up with a word of prayer, and then we're going to go right to the very beginning. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. While you're turning there, I'll tell my one and only joke for today. You know they played baseball in the Bible. In the beginning. Okay. Let's go to God. <laughs> Let's pray before it gets any worse. Let's pray. Father God, you are awesome. You're amazing. We're in awe of you. We fear you. We honor you. Never enough. And it's your God overall. Father, thank you for your power. Thank you for all that you've done in our lives individually. Father, to look out and see the sunrise in the morning, the sunset in the evening, and know that you're totally in control of that. You can stop it if you want to. Father, thank you that you are all powerful and you're sovereign that you can be with and in each and every one of us any time you want. So grateful that you want to be with us. You don't have to. Father, I pray that today as we get into your word, that our hearts will be moved, that we would understand just a little bit better what your spirit is all about, who you are. God, I pray so much that we would know you better after we walk out today. Please speak through me. Move me out of the way. And God, help me to say the words you would have me to say. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, let's go to the beginning. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. It says here, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So even before the earth was created, the Spirit of God wanted to be close to part of his creation. He came close to you. He just, he just floated over the hover, hovered over the waters right there. I don't know if you ever had the chance just to, to fly across the top of the water. I haven't either. <laughs> but I have been in a boat and a couple of jet skis. And man, let me tell you, just to just kind of float along the water, there's something about it. I think God was kind of having fun jumping waves, you know? I mean, that's what I would do. And here we find the first mention of the Spirit of God is in the very first chapter of the book. 553 times in the scripture, the word spirit is used. Many of those times literally talking about the Spirit of God. Look in chapter 6. When I see a word used that many times in the scriptures, it makes me know that God wants us to know something about it. He wants us to understand something about his spirit because once you get to know the spirit of God, you get to know God a little bit better. In chapter 6, it says in verse 11, I hope I have the right one here. Verse 
My writing sometimes is like hieroglyphics. This is not the right one. I'm going I'm to find it. There, there it is. It's verse, verse, one, verse 1. It's verse 1, 2, verse 3. How about that? It looks like a 13. Amen. You know the scripture about unschooled ordinary men? Chapter 6 and verse 1, the Bible says, When men began to increase in number on the earth, and the daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be a hundred and twenty years. So after the flood, the lifespan of men began to reduce dramatically, because God says it's too much. I'm not, I can't be with you this long. He wipes out all of mankind except the eight on the ark. His spirit will only contend with us for a period of time. Look in Judges chapter 3. In verse 10. At this time, remember that Israel had done so many sinful things that judges had to raise up and rescue them time after time again. And in Judges chapter 3 and verse 10, it says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. Right here we find that when the Spirit of God comes upon a man, something dramatic happens. Something powerful happens. They needed to fight to get out of the oppression that they were in to overcome the discipline from the sin they were in. So God put his Spirit on this new judge. And as soon as the Spirit came upon him, he goes, it's time to go to war. When the Spirit of God comes on you, it's time to go to war. Look in chapter 14. In verse 5, the Bible says, Samson went down to Timnah, together with his father and mother. As they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn apart a young goat. Now, I've never torn apart a young goat. <laughs> Samson did. So a lion was a little bit too tough. So the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he just ripped the lion apart because the Spirit of the Lord was on him. Wow. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 10. We're going to do some Bible study today, and we'll get into our text in a moment. At this time, Samuel is the spiritual leader, and the people have been asking and whining for a king, and so they decide to anoint. God decides to have Saul anointed. In 1 Samuel 10, in verse 6, he says, The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you in power, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. When the Spirit of God comes upon you, you will become a different person. So if you think that you didn't change much when you became a Christian, it's because you didn't. When the Spirit of God comes upon us, there is a dramatic change that's so significant, no one will recognize who you are. Oh, you'll look the same, but you're going to act totally different, and they'll see your heart. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. Amen. The same Spirit that hovered over the waters can become part of us. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. This is a powerful verse here. Pick it up in verse 7. David writes, Where can I go from your spirits? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise in the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, Surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even darkness will, be not dark, will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Wow. 
This is what the Spirit of God can do. You can't hide. You come to church on Sunday, and the Spirit of God is here. You go to the bar on Saturday, and the Spirit of the Lord is there. You get drunk on Saturday afternoon, the Spirit of the Lord is there. You're being immoral on a Monday, the Spirit of the Lord is there. You claim to be a Christian on Tuesday, but you're living like the devil. The Spirit of the Lord is there. He knows what's going on. He's with you. He sees it. He knows it. And He's with you to give you strength to overcome that. Is that your heart? Acts chapter 4. The disciples started facing some persecution. Some difficult things had come against them. They were preaching the truth about Jesus, and people hated it. They didn't want to be lumped in with those who crucified Jesus, but the fact is that every single human being that walks on the face of the earth, because of their sin, because of your sin, and because of my sin, we crucified Jesus, period. Makes you a murderer. Murderers don't go to heaven unless there's forgiveness. When forgiveness comes... The Spirit of the Lord can be with you. So they're facing this persecution. They're being persecuted for what they believe and what they stand for. And they decide to pray. What else would they do? In verse 31, it says, after they played, prayed. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. So in the midst of persecution and threats to stop preaching the word, they prayed, they begged God, be with us. The nations are raging around us. But let me tell you something. I'm not going to stop being a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm going to lay it out. I'm going to tell people the truth. But see, sometimes I want to depend on my flesh. I want to depend on myself. I just got to be tougher. I got to be more of a man, right? Baloney. The strongest man among us will fall dead with the struggles that come against us if you don't depend on God, if His Spirit is not with you. It's too much. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about it in the lesson. If we could just see the spiritual world ripped open and see what's going on around us, we would all fall dead in fear. But the Spirit of God can be with you. Today, I want you to ask yourself a question. Is the Spirit of God really with you? If He's not, you know it. If He's not, and you're pretending, today you'll know it. My job as a disciple and as God's evangelist for this city is to make sure that people hear the message so that they can really have a confidence in their relationship with God. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. You're coming to church in vain. There's no reason to be here unless the Spirit of God can be in you and with you and do these great things that He has laid out for you. Today, is the Spirit of God with you. I mean, really. Have you had some experience, some phony baloney religious experience where you suddenly think the Spirit of God is with you, but it doesn't match the Bible? Wow. Guys, the Bible says that Satan can perform miracles through people. Yes. Miracles don't prove anything unless the message is correct. Yes. If the message isn't correct about how to be a, a true disciple, then, then the, the miracles are false. How are you doing today, really, in your relationship with God? I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to tell you what the Spirit of God needs you to hear so that you can truly have a relationship with Him that is flat out awesome. The greatest thing in the history of mankind has been given to us. Yeah. But if we don't follow the Bible, there is no chance. There is no hope. The title of the lesson today is The Awful Truth. I have three points. He is awful. Point number two, he is lawful. And point number three, because nothing would rhyme with awful and lawful, he is peace. <laughs> I guess waffle does, but really doesn't fit in with the Bible. Thank you, Marcel. <laughs> when we're talking about the Spirit of God, the awful truth is he is awful. Now, we in 2019 think awful means like, oh, like that awful smell, right? But see, a little bit archaic use of the word was awful was very different. Awful literally means inspiring, reverential wonder or fear. 
wow, that was awful. Now we say awesome, right? But many years ago, it was like awful, wow. So the awful truth, he is awful. Turn over to John chapter 14. We'll get to our text in a moment. Got to get a running start so we really know where we're going. John 14 and verse 15. You guys ready? If you love me, you will obey what I command. Sermon's over. <laughs> Jesus to say, hey, if you love me, you're going to obey what I command. So what's the opposite? I don't know. Just a quick question. How was your week? In obedience. Amen? Got real quiet. <laughs> Got a bunch of sinners in here today. But if you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, and he's talking to his apostles here, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Wow! you got to obey to have the Spirit, the Counselor, be with you. Are you with me here? Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. What he says to Judas here is everyone can see me. Everyone can have part with my spirit if they love me and obey me. Everyone. And we will make our home with him. Verse 24, he who does not love me will not obey my teaching. The word, these words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Do you want the Holy Spirit? Man, look what he says. He's going to send the Counselor. The counselor will remind you of everything Jesus taught, and he'll give you things to say. Wow. Verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give, I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. You heard me say I'm going away, and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Look at the humility. I have told you that. I have told you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not speak to you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me, but the world must learn that I love the Father, and I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. So now we're introduced officially by Jesus to the Holy Spirit. The word Holy, Holy Spirit in the Greek is interesting. It's holy, hagion, hagios, hagos, an awful thing. Holy. It is awesome. It is awful in the awesome sense. The holiness of God. We'll never match it. We'll only see it when we get to heaven. Even then, I'm not sure if we'll totally understand the holiness of God. It is an awful thing. Literally means to be sacred, pure, and blameless. Holy spirits. An awful thing. Spirit is the word pneuma. Pneuma is a current of air, a spirit of a rational soul, superhuman divinity, an advocate. Is that not cool? So the Holy Spirit, the awful Holy Spirit of God can be with us. Then he uses the word counselor several times. Counselor is the same as comforter, intercessor, consoler. Do you ever need to be consoled? Stop crying on your mama's shoulder. 
Stop going to your roommate or your, your, your D partner. Amen. You can talk to them and they need to direct you. Go to God. They can pray with you. They can encourage you. But their encouragement means go to God. He's the comfort. I'm not. You want me to be the comfort? You're going to kill me. I can't give enough to you. I can't console you enough. And I certainly don't have any kind of wisdom compared to God. Point number one, he is awful. He is awful in the awesome sense. So if we put it all together, the spirit of God, the spirit of peace, the spirit of truth, the spirit of Christ, an awful, sacred, pure current of air, the superhuman divine spirit of God, is he with you today? Jesus says in chapter 16 and verse 1, all this I have told you so that you will not go astray. You know, quite often disciples go astray. You hear the message, you understand what it says, you read it, you have faith, you believe, you even repent, you get baptized, you totally change. Six months later, eight months later, four years later, ten years later, you start going, I don't know if God is with me because you've drifted back into sin. You don't feel the, the power of the Spirit anymore. The awful power of God is dwindled away, not because he's weaker, but because you're sinning again. You've turned your eyes back to the world and you start drifting away. So Jesus tries to tell them, listen, I've told you all these things so that you won't go astray. I want to be with you. I don't want to leave is always God's heart. We're the ones that cause him to leave because of our sinful ways. He says they'll put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he's offering service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. See, they don't know the Spirit. The most violent persecution that we face is against religious people. Religious people are the ones who, who persecute us the most. Yeah. Why? Because they don't have the Spirit of God. That's why. Yeah. So they hear the truth and they're confused. They get offended rather than inspired and encouraged that they need to repent and have the Spirit of God really be with them. They do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this, so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first because I was with you. See, when Jesus was with them, he protected them from everything. But he says, I'm going away. I'm going back to heaven. And the disciples started getting worried. Well, what's that mean? What's that? What's going to happen now? And he says, I'm sending you the counselor. I'm sending you the spirit. It's going to be okay. I'm telling you this now. See, none of us have ever been able to physically walk with Jesus. But what you have, if you're a disciple of Christ and you're faithful, you have the Spirit of God in you. He can walk with you any day, anywhere, anytime. This is awesome. This is powerful. This is awful. In the awesome sense. Now I'm going to him who sent me. Yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I have said these things. You are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Thank God. Yeah. You and I never will get the chance to physically walk with Jesus. And yet he says, don't worry about it. I can be with you even closer when I go back to heaven. Because my spirit will be with you. The spirit of God. An awful, sacred, pure, current of air, the superhuman, divine spirit of God is promised to each one of us who become his disciples. He says multiple times, if you love me, you'll obey me, and I'll live with you. The world cannot accept him because the world will not repent and hold to the scriptures. So he won't give the spirit to the world. He says that he will be in you. Look in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Paid up in verse 14. Paul writes, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and earth derives his name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have Power to with all the saints, grasp how wide, long, high, and deep is the love of Christ. But you can't do that unless you have the Spirit. 
He is awful. He is all powerful. And when we have the Spirit of God with us, there is nothing that is impossible. Yeah. Nothing. And you and I need to believe that and put to death sinful thoughts that don't believe it. It's faithlessness. You can overcome anything. You can change anything. If you're going to do it for God, anything you set out to do, in fact, will be done. Just give it a little time. Amen. When the Spirit of God is with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 21. He says, now it is, to, it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. So when you become a true disciple, he literally buys you. He buys you from the cost that needed to be paid. And that was for our sin. He buys you with the blood of Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus. And then he says, now I'm going to put in you the very Spirit of God, who is a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Here's what's interesting. The Holy Spirit does not save you. So if someone, quote, receives the Holy Spirit, that is not what saved them. What saved us is the blood of Jesus. That's what saves us, because that's where the forgiveness of sins come. Quite often people go, I'm saved. I'm saved from what? Uh, I'm, I'm saved. From what? From sin. The consequence of sin is death. So if you're not saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you are condemned. God does not want us condemned, but unless you are saved according to the Bible, you are condemned. That's either bad news or good news. It's good news if you go, I'm going to obey the Bible. It's bad news if you go, I'm going to do my own thing. And then the Spirit of the Lord will not be with you. See, on Judgment Day, he's going to be looking for a couple of things. Did you become a disciple? Get baptized. Live a life faithful. Oh, and by the way, oh, yep, you've got the Spirit. If you don't, you do not have the deposit guarantee your entrance into heaven. You ever gone and looked at a car? Like, oh, it's beautiful. Look at that car. Wow. That thing's going to be fast. It's going to be fun. You're going to take a little test drive. You're thinking about it. But the truth is you don't really have enough money. And tell the guy, hey, I was wondering, if, can you hold it for me for a couple days? He goes, well, just give me a deposit. You're like, uh, well, how much? Uh, like $1,000. So you give him $1,000, a little nervous. And then on the next couple of weeks, you, 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 you've realized, like, I can do this. I can pay for the car. And you go back. And you go, hey, you still got the car, right? You go, of course. You gave me a deposit. All good. Here's your car. Let's go. Now, if you drive that car around and you really love it, and you go, no, 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 I'll be back. Trust me. No, 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 trust me. No, I'm serious. Do you know how many times that salesman has heard that? And he's, well, just give me a deposit. No, 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 I don't, I don't want to do the deposit thing. Well, I might not have it when you get back. Three weeks later, you come back, I'm ready. I'm ready for the car. He's like, well, you didn't have a deposit, so I sold it. That's just a car. We're talking about salvation. We're talking about salvation. Is the deposit guaranteeing what is to come with you and in you? Prayerfully, he is. Ephesians chapter 1. You guys okay? Yes, Ephesians chapter 1. And verse 11, it says, In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Once again, he talks about the deposit guaranteeing. For me, I spent many years wondering, thinking, trying to understand the Holy Spirit. Had no idea. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're confused about the Holy Spirit, who he is, what he does, and how he comes into your life, it's because you don't know the gospel. That's it. So here's the cool thing. Get to know the gospel and you understand how to have the power of the Spirit with you. The awful power of God can be in each 
and every one of us when we understand. Yeah. Write down Matthew 1 verse 18, the Spirit allowed Mary to become pregnant without having a husband. Yeah. Matthew chapter 3, chapter 3 verse 7 through 17, John the Baptist is preaching about how Jesus is coming and he's going to bring the Spirit of fire. And he's going to get rid of anything in his church that's just like chaff. It's not real. It's fake. He's going to get rid of all of that because he's looking for those who have the spirits. And right after that, he says, John, John the Baptist, I want you to baptize me. And John goes, oh, no, no, Jesus, I can't do that. Jesus says, yes, you can. That's what you need to do. Amen, bro. John baptizes Jesus as Jesus comes up out of the water. Now, Jesus does not need to receive the spirit. He is the spirit. So when he comes out of the water, just to convince all of us, what happens but a dove comes down from heaven and he, God had told John, when the, when the dove lands on one, that's the one who is my savior. So John didn't even totally get it until he baptized Jesus, saw the spirit of God come down and rest on him, representing what's gonna happen to a true disciple. When you repent and get baptized, the spirit of God will be with you. You know, since the beginning of the year, we've seen some miracles happen. We saw Gladys baptized, Charles baptized, Alex Montaigne baptized, Mimi was baptized, Laura was baptized, Zach was baptized, Gavin baptized, Stephanie was baptized, Jennifer, Angela, David, Alexander, Alex, Jordy, Samara, and last week, Nick was restored. That's just this year. That's just this year. Wait a minute, it's only March, exactly. What can the Spirit of God do? The Spirit of God can save this whole city like that if he wants to. But you and I have to live out the Spirit of God that's in us. We have to follow Him and obey Him so that more people can be saved. Amen. You know, when I think of Nick, I know uh, he became closer friends, close friends with Marcel. And they started talking about his life and a difficult life he had. He repented. He became a disciple. He was baptized quite a few years ago. But over time, the troubles got in his way, and you heard him share about it last week. He walked away from God. He knew it was wrong. He knew it wasn't right. He knew what he was doing wasn't the church's fault. But he was longing to come back. And when the chance came, our brother Nick came back. I'm reminded of the lost son in Luke chapter 15. The son gets all he has together, takes his father's inheritance, and he runs away, he spends all of his money, finds himself eating pig food. You ever seen pig food? That's nasty. Pigs are nasty. And he remembers, wait a minute, I've got a father. I've got a father that loves me. My father takes care of my, the servants. What am I doing here? And he goes back. And you see in the, in the, in, in, in the, the imagery there in, in Luke chapter 15, it says, while his son was a long way off, the father saw him. What does that tell you? Every day. The father was going out. He was waiting on the hill and he's just looking, hoping, I hope my son comes back. And as soon as he saw him, he runs to him. This is the heart of God. He runs to him. The only time in the scriptures that I know of where there's an image of God running is when he's going to get his son back. See, this, the truth is, he is awful but awful in an awesome way. And even though he's so powerful, he wants to be with us. He wants us to be close to him. Even right now, if you've drifted away from God and you're a disciple, I want to challenge you to come back. He's waiting. He'll forgive you. He'll forgive you. What you've done is not too bad. Come back. Get your head straight. The Father is waiting. He'll run to you. If you've never become a disciple, I want to challenge you. Study the scriptures. Really understand. I don't get the spirit. Just be humble, please. If you don't know, just say you don't know. We get all this religious speak. Oh, Lord God Almighty, Jesus, woo, whatever. Sit down, shut up, and let the Bible talk to you. In all humility. I'm nothing. But the Bible can straighten each one of us out right now. 
Let the Bible straighten you out. If you haven't figured it out, if you don't know what it means to really be a disciple, or maybe you've been a part of some church and you're not being called to really be sold out for God. See, only a sold out disciple is going to be having the Spirit in them. And I want you to have that. I want every single person here to have the opportunity, if you've drifted away, to come back and get strong again. If you've never become part of God's church, to study the Bible until you understand, and then you too become a disciple. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's go back to John chapter 16. I got to hurry up here. Point number one is he is awful. Point number two, he is lawful. What do I mean by this? God created the universe, and there are spiritual principles in the universe that will not change. He made it that way, and we can't change it. I don't care what you do or how bad you want it, it's just the way he did it. He is lawful. He is just. You ever said, oh, it's not fair. <laughs> you don't want fair. I don't want fair. I want mercy. I want justice <laughs> based on my faith in the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen? Here in John chapter 16, we're going to pick it up. Keep reading in verse 8. It says, when he comes, he will convict the world of sin. Excuse me. He will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Wow. So when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to be busy convicting. You ever felt convicted? You're you're about to do something, you just know it's wrong, you get that little, uh, oh, oh, what was that? That's the Holy Spirit going, hey, dummy, don't do that. <laughs> and then sometimes you're, we're really, really knuckleheaded. We're really private, and we just go ahead and do it anyway. And afterwards, you feel that, that, that you ever felt it's like right in here? You go, oh, why did I do that? What was I thinking? That's the Spirit convicting you. Hey, dummy, come back. What are you doing? See, he is, he's lawful. He's just. So in regard to sin, because men do not believe in me, so he's going to convict us in regard to sin because of a lack of belief. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where he can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, and by the way, the spirit is not an it. The spirit is a he. I hear people say, oh, it did this. It, it, it's not an it. That'd be like me saying, Helen, it, come here. Yeah, super offensive, right? God is a being. His spirit is a being. Alive, not an it. Okay? So let's make sure we do that. That we understand that God, His Spirit, is not an it, it's a He. Are you with me? But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide us into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. So some of the things that Jesus wasn't yet able to tell them, He said, don't worry about it. I'm sharing that with the Spirit. And He will be able to take care of you, and He will teach you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make known to you. Right here we find Jesus, once again, giving more confidence and more comfort to the disciples if they hold on and stand firm until the Spirit comes. Because in the universe, there are spiritual laws that he made that cannot be broken unless the Spirit of God intervenes. You and I are supposed to be condemned, but he's willing and able to save. Is that not awesome? There are three things here that he's come to convict us of. One is sin. Sin is a result of a lack of belief. Why do we sin? When we stop believing who God is. We don't understand who he is. Remember, the title of the lesson is the awful truth. What will God do to a man or a woman who continues to sin? He loves them. He's given everything to save them. And yet, he is lawful. There will be a judgment day. Every single one of us will die and you will face God. Period. That's what's going to happen. So without belief, there's no repentance because we have no desire to honor God. Do you really believe? The thing that I've come to conviction about is the more we know Him, the more we will transform. 
the more you get to know God and his spirit and his son, the more you start to transform. You'll be going through life, I don't want to do those things anymore. I want to help someone. I want to serve someone. I want to give to other people instead of trying to take. How often have we taken and taken and still we're empty and unfulfilled? That's the result. But rather, if we seek to honor and glorify God, how fulfilled we are, how happy we are. He meets all of those needs when we're in step with his spirits. But without belief, there's no repentance, and you will not honor God. Without a fear of God, there is no respect, which breeds rebellion in your hearts. Do you ever had that moment where you're just like, I just don't care anymore. You're going to sin worse. Brilliant idea. I've done it. I literally, one time, I smashed my hand on my bed, and then I punched a hole in my wall. Oh, excuse me, at my door. Of course, my dad found out later that wasn't pretty. And I literally yelled out, if I can't be a Christian, I'm going to be as bad as I can be. Yeah, that was a brilliant idea. Ruined my life for about three years. Totally messed up my life. That's what happens when we don't believe. Do you believe? I mean really believe. Not airy, fairy, nebulous sort of kind of belief. But real belief and who God is, and what the Lord wants to do in your life, and what the Bible says. Is there a real belief? See, real belief produces change. Real belief produ produces repentance, produces a different person. You become literally a different person when you believe. So I want you to ask yourself today, is the Holy Spirit convicting you right now of sin in your life? Then repent and believe. Then he talks about in regard to righteous because I'm going to the Father. Jesus is saying, listen, I know you're worried about me leaving. I know you feel like you're not going to be able to be righteous when I leave, but it's no problem. I'm sending my spirit to you. 25 times in the Bible, he says the power of God, the power of the spirit. The power of the spirit is with us so that we can overcome sin and live the Christian life. Then he talks about in regard to judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Here's the thing we've got to come to a conviction about. Either you are with God or you are with Satan. There's no in between. No, no, I'm just waiting a few years until I figure this thing out, and then I'll go with God. Right now, I'm not with Satan. No, I'm just you know, doing my own thing. No, you're not. You're either with God 100% or you're with Satan 100%. There is no twilight zone. There's no gray area. Period. You're either in the light or you're in the darkness. Where are you today? If you need to ask me, but I don't understand how to get into the light. It's because you, you're not in the light. You're in the darkness. Amen. Once again, it's good news. It's good news. Just repent. Learn what the scripture says and be on God's side. Amen. Amen. You know, right here, it gets kind of heavy. He is lawful. And without the Spirit of God being with us, we will be judged for our sin. I, I don't want that. I, I, I need an advocate. I need a counselor. The things that I've done in my life, I deserve help. And so do you. So today, honestly, before God, are you afraid of the fact that God is lawful? Or are you fired up? See, if you understand how to have the Spirit of God in your life, you're actually fired up that He's lawful. You're fired up that there are spiritual, princi spiritual principles in the universe that you can live by and then be saved by. Amen. This is a good thing. And finally, we see that He is peace. John 16 and verse 16. He says, in a little while, you'll see me no more. Then after a little while, you'll see me. That's good news. Amen. Some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you'll see me no more, and after a little while you'll see me? And because I'm going to the Father, they kept asking, what, what does he mean in a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you'll see me no more, and after a little while you'll see me? See, right now, they still don't really totally get it. They, they'd been with him for a while, but they just didn't understand. You ever felt that way? I've been a Christian for a long time, I still just don't get it. Amen. Maybe you'll get it right now. 
I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child is pain because her time has come. But when the baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that the child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief. But I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. I'll tell you the truth. My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked me for anything in my name. And ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I've been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, am I not saying, I am not saying, that I will ask my Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have to believe that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, now you're speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things that you don't even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Now his apostles are starting to really believe. The fear, the worry they had about the sacrifice, the suffering, the pain they would go through following him was almost too much, especially when he said, I'm going back to the Father. Like, wait, 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 we can't do this. He says, yes, you can. I'm going to send my spirit to be with you. You can do this. And he says in verse 31, you believe at last. Jesus answered, but a time is coming and has come when you will be scattered each to his own home. You'll leave me all alone. So even here, Jesus predicting their betrayal. Even after following him for all these years, they still doubted. Yet I'm not alone, for my Father is with me. Can you see the confidence that Jesus had? He knew that his best friends, the guys that he poured his life into, the guys that he left heaven to come and be with, he knew that they would betray him. And he goes, it's okay, guys. I know you're all going to betray me. It's okay. I understand. I got God with me. The Spirit is with me. I'm going to be fine. I think quite often disciples freak out, worry, get all upset, anxious, emotional. We all flip out at some points. But then instead of going to God, you go to your friend, hey, can you fix me? Your friend cannot fix you. If your best friendship is with a man or a woman, you're in trouble. Your best friend needs to be God. He can be with you because he's not limited by space and time. See, Jesus, the physical part of him, went back and he sent his spirit to be with you. He can be with you anywhere you go. Anywhere you go, anytime. And here's what's cool. He's not limited. He can only talk to me and not talk to you while he's talking to me. I can talk to him and have this super intimate, amazing relationship with him. And you can be doing the same thing at the same time. And so can 7 billion people around the world. Because his spirit is able. He can be with you every day. So when you're freaking out, when life is crashing down upon you, stop going to your friends and get on your knees and go to God, the one who can save you. Yes, we need friends. Of course. But my best friends will point me back to God. And not to them. A person that points to himself is not your friend. They don't understand. They're dependent on their flesh, and their flesh will fail. And you'll fail along with them. But God will never fail. Let's close out in Galatians chapter 5. You know, in Galatians 5, we are very familiar with the acts of the sinful nature, aren't we? Yeah. That's the one everyone seems to remember. Yeah. Matter of fact, it says the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage. Huh, sounds like my life about 25, 30 years ago. Yeah. Selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. And the like. What's that? Yeah, anything like that. <laughs> Holy cow. And then he says, I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. I don't care if you got baptized. I don't care if you go to church every Sunday, you go to Wednesday night, Bible talk, share your faith. It does not matter. If you live like this, the Bible says, I don't care what any preacher says, I don't care what any priest says, 
It does not matter what they say. The Bible says if you live like this, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now that can be good news or bad news. Are you with me? If we would just get broken and honor the spirit of God, the spirit of peace, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of truth, an awful, sacred, pure, current of air, the superhuman, divine spirit of God, then you'll repent of all that stuff. You'll put it to death. And then verse 22 becomes very powerful. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit. See, the fruit of simple nature is all this garbage. That's what you and I create. We create a lot of fruit. Fruit called sin. And it gives babies. It gives birth to more babies, more sin. I mean, we, we, we can be very fruitful with our sin. But right here he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I love that. Look what he says. Against those things there is no law. Have you ever told someone, you're just too loving. You're just too much love. Just stop. Right now. That's it. it hurts me. You just love so much. Of course not. You're like, the more, more. Joy. You're like, I weigh too much joy. We're going over here. Too much joy over here. I'm going over here where the grumpy people are. Like, get up in the morning. I can't wait to be grumpy. Grumpy for Jesus. No, that is not what a disciple does. And yet, I do find that when we don't appreciate what we have, we don't appreciate the church. You don't understand what you have. Maybe you've had a hard time. Maybe someone in the church even hurt you. I'm sure that's going to happen because we're a bunch of sinners. And verses 19 to 21 describes a lot of what we were like not too long ago, and we're trying to get out of that garbage. So guess what? We're probably going to hurt you, and you're going to hurt me. But then you lose the gratitude for the church. You lose gratitude for forgiveness. You lose gratitude for the Spirit of God that can be in you and make you into a different person. Next thing you know, there's not joy come out of you. When there's not joy of God coming out of you, because the fruit of the Spirit is not being born in your life, you're not in step with the Spirit. It then becomes very hard to go share your faith. Hey, come be a part of the church that I hate. Come be a part of the church that, you know, I don't know, they hurt me all the time. Why are you not bringing visitors? Why aren't you sharing your faith? Because you're not filled with joy. Maybe someone hurt you, and I'm very sorry that happened. I'm sure that's going to happen at some point. Someone's going to let you down, hurt you. It's bad. We're human. Please forgive us. And remember what they're trying to become is what the Holy Spirit is making them into. Love, joy, peace, patience, guidance, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control should be coming out of every one of us. Sometimes some of the other junk slips out. Don't blame God. Don't blame the church. Blame the person. Make it right with them. Forgive them. And then get your joy back. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to start bringing a lot of people with you. Come with me. You've got to come see my church. Ah, they're a bunch of sinners, but I love them. Are you with me here? Oh, I can't end the sermon without talking about money. <laughs> like 20 people get up and walk out. Here's the thing, guys. We're in the middle of special missions. We've been charged with the task that's the greatest one I've ever personally been a part of, to raise $156,000 for missions. We just planted the church in Atlanta. We've talked about this many times. Planning Kathmandu, Nepal. I just found out last night that Hal and I will be going to New Delhi in May. Then we're going to take a quick uh, trip over to Kathmandu to scout out the land. I don't know about you, but I've always wanted to go to Kathmandu. We, we're going to have a church there because of special missions. But when you're not filled with joy, you start thinking about sacrifice, you're like, um, give to missions, I don't know, it's so hard. So challenging. Church pressures me. But when you're filled with joy, you understand what we're doing. You've worked out some of the relationships where people maybe hurt you or let you down. All of a sudden you go, you know what? I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere. I'll give up everything for the sake of Christ. Amen. Period. You'll be filled with joy. The fruit of the Spirit starts coming out of you. So raising money for missions to help plant another church is no big deal. You're like, of course I'm going to do that. You know what God's heart is? God's heart is to have his church in every single city in the world. That's his heart. 
In every city in the world, he wants to save the lost. In every city in the world, he wants to bring the lost to straight, the, those who are saved straight away. He wants to bring them back. That's his heart. Everywhere the Spirit goes, he wants his people with him. We need to get to every single city in the world. And if you're not filled with joy, if the fruit of the Spirit's not coming out of you, that becomes a burden. But when the Spirit of God is working in you, and you are grateful for what you have, the fruit of the Spirit starts coming out of you. Next thing you know, raising money for missions is like, this is just what I do. This is who I am. Matter of fact, can you help me? And it becomes your heart. Right here he goes on to say, Against those things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the Son of nature with his passion and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. You know, I have this image in my mind. I picture God. Try to picture God for a moment. He's big. The awful God that we have. He's huge. And sometimes when I'm having a few doubts, I'm having a few struggles, imagine walking ahead of me. I go, man, if I could just grab onto his, his robe, just hold on for a second, I could be a little bit closer to him and I won't quit, and I'll bring some more people with me. When I'm really doing well, I go, maybe I can grab his toe, just grab on his toe, and he'll take me with me. Where, wherever he goes, I can go with him. And as I go with him, the more I get close to him and try to hold on to him, the more I want other people to come with me and, and be able to see what God has for them. See, today I want to challenge you to keep in step with the Spirit of God. So the awful truth is he is awful. The awful truth is he is lawful. And the awful truth is he is peace. I love you guys.